uh, 15 years ago, uh, when I was in, uh, in sales, the rage, let's see if we can get the, uh, do we have this thing going? There we go. The rage in a lot of offices were what they called motivational posters. Do you remember these? Right? They, they did something like this. They would have this amazing picture and it would say something like, determination, it's the size of one's will which determines success, right? And you would be inspired by all these uh, posters. Well, what someone did was they created despair posters. Remember these? They're awesome, okay? They, they would do things like this. They would do a beautiful picture like and say, ambition, the journey of a thousand miles sometimes ends very, very badly, <laughs> right? Or how about this one? Challenges. I expected times like this but never thought they'd be so bad, so long, and so frequent. Stupidity. I love this one. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. But those who never win and never quit are idiots. <laughs> and I love this one too. Mediocrity takes a lot less time, and most people won't notice the difference until it's too late. Right? Demotivation. And there's one more that I think pertains to us this morning. It's simply this one. It shows a shipwreck and it says mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. I think in some ways this last one encapsulates some of what we've been looking at as we've gone through this whole idea of lessons from the desert because we've been, we're almost at the end of this series. Next week's our last one. And we've been saying through this entire thing that the desert, that, that time between where we were and where we're going, where it feels off, right? It can be depressing. It can be struggle. It can be a problem. That's actually a fertile place. It's fertile ground for transformation, and most of us, when we're in the desert, are either going to be transformed in a positive direction, to be like more like Jesus wants us to be, or negatively. And we've been using the wanderings of the Israelites as a metaphor um, for a lot of this, um, for all this, 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 the principles that we've been looking at. And we, we have the benefit of learning not only from our own mistakes, but the mistakes of other people, the mistakes people before us have made so that hopefully we don't make the same mistakes, right? You do this with your kids all the time. You're like, hey, learn from me. I did this. It didn't turn out well. Don't do that, right? We get the same benefit. And so up till now, we've been looking at this whole idea that um, when we're in the desert, it's, it's how we respond to our circumstances that matters, that we're not supposed to be complaining people, but people who bring to God our laments, the things that is, that is killing us in the middle of the desert. And we saw that we're supposed to do this as we walk in community together because we have a God who sees and who understands us. What we're going to look at this morning, one of the last things, is that we're going to find that the desert is a fertile place for transformation. And one of the things that God uses to make that transformation happen is discipline, which is a lovely topic. But I think you're going to find it very encouraging. So let's pray before we jump in. Lord, as always in this whole series, uh, in this room today, there's a whole breadth of experiences. There are some of us who are in the middle of desert experiences that have lasted a very long time. Uh, some it's a short time, just a, a depressed week or a bad, just a bad stretch. For others of us, we've been in the desert, but right now everything's pretty good and we, we actually are quite happy with where you've got us in life. God, it doesn't really matter where we are. Because eventually we all walk through the desert. And so would you this morning speak to us through your Holy Spirit? Whisper in our ears. Help us to hear what you have to say. With open hearts. Willing hands. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Ronnie is a 10th grade basketball player. He's full of potential. He's a... Uh, um, he leads the team in scoring and rebounding. He's 6'6 six, six already. He has uncommon agility and coordination. Uh, he's good without even working at it, and that's the problem. Discipline was a problem. He wasn't working at it. He would show up late uh, to practices. He would miss mandatory meetings and just say, oh, I'm sorry, coach, I forgot. You know, when the coach would give him some direction, you'd get the eye roll. And so one day, a JV coach asked to see him. And when Ronnie showed up, he was surprised because not only was the JV coach there, but the varsity coach was there. And the JV coach says to him, he says, look, you are an outstanding player with a ton 
of potential. But you are unwilling to receive correction. You refuse to arrive on time, and your contempt for the coaching staff is poisoning the team. You are going to be benched for the next two games. You are going to dress, and you will warm up, but you will not play even if we are behind. And then the varsity coach weighs in. He says, look, I've been watching you, Ronnie. You have tremendous talent. It's unquestionable. But if your attitude doesn't change, you will not be playing on my varsity team next year. Now, Ronnie might feel like the coaches are trying to destroy his season. I can't believe you're doing this to me. Why are you doing this? Why do you, just, why do you have it out for me? But the mature observer will know that the coach has actually disciplined Ronnie because he's trying not just to save his season, but potentially a career. It's important. See, when we look at this idea of discipline and God's discipline, he inflicts pain in order to save us or rescue us from something. And when God disciplines us in a way and it seems harsh, it seems difficult to bear, it could be that maybe he's just attempting to rescue something in your life. And so the, the main idea that what I want to, it's difficult to grab on, especially when we're in the middle of the desert, is simply this principle. And what happened now? I did not happen there. I'm going to turn this way. God's discipline is a gift. It's actually a gift. See, part of our problem when we're going through the deserts of life is we make them worse than they need to be. More painful. Because our actions, our reactions, our overreactions to what goes on in the desert actually compounds our situation. And the desert is hard enough anyway. I mean, the terrain is tough. Things are difficult. And our patience then begins to dwindle. We begin to demand stuff of God. But if we begin to recognize and understand and embrace God's discipline, it actually can be extraordinarily helpful. So let's take a look at it. Let's look at our story again. We're talking about the Israelites. And we're going to go back to a story we, we've talked about a couple times. But I want to focus in on a particular uh, aspect about it. And if you remember this, we talked about this in the last couple of weeks. Um, the Israelites were complaining because, remember, they had wanted food. They had manna. And then they got tired of manna. And then they wanted meat, right? You remember this whole thing? We talked a little bit about this uh, last week. And I remember this story as a kid because you would read through, uh, this, you know, I'd read through my Bible and I would, it's just an amazing story, right? Because God would, um, would do something amazing to provide meat. We read this, right? A wind went out from the Lord and it drove quail in from the sea and it scattered them up to two cubits deep, feet deep, all a day's walk in every direction. And all that day and night, all the next day, the people went out and they gathered quail. In other words, they had more meat than they could possibly eat. No one gathered less than 10 homers. They spread them out all around the camp. So far, so good. I remember this part of the story when I was a kid. What was not included in my children's story was the next part. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, in other words, they're literally just biting into this roasted quail, the anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava because they buried the people who had craved other food. Now, sit with that for a second. Is that comfortable for you? They wanted meat, so God killed a bunch of them. Like, put yourself in that. All of a sudden, you have an uncle, spouse, a kid, someone you know, and they're dead because they wanted meat. Now, I don't know where you sit with that. It seems excessive. I mean, how does that fit with our vision of Jesus, right? Our New Testament version of Jesus. Like, does this seem excessive? I mean, they complain and they die. But there's something bigger going on. And I see a couple things that come out of this and, and a couple of others. It's this. God actually desires us to learn from our mistakes. Because we have to take a step back to see what's really going on here. Because in fact, God is not striking them dead because they complained about me. That's not, that's not really the issue. And we actually get a clue in God's response to their complaint. Here's what he said. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Huh. Now the Lord will give you meat and you'll eat of it. 
right? Remember we read this last week. You will not eat of it for just one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty, but for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Twice we see that in here. The people were complaining, saying we were better off in Egypt. What they're essentially saying is, God, we were better off without you. We, when we didn't have this going on, we weren't following you, things were better. This isn't just a, a complaint about wanting better food. The crime here, really, is treason. Because think about what's going on. They've been spending the, a whole bunch of time following a pillar of cloud and fire, right? I mean, this is amazing. They're seeing this. That's what leads them through the desert. They have three tribes camped kind of in the four quadrants. And in the center, they have this tabernacle that they built where the presence of God rests. They're seeing this all the time, right? The God who is among you, he's right there for you. And they continue to rebel. It's this history of rebellion. It's something that's not just part of an isolated event. And instead, this hardship that God was putting there so that they would trust him more does the exact opposite. The hardship causes them to complain more, to rebel more, to say, I don't need you, God. I was better off without you. Easy to do when we're in the desert. Now, what's interesting is this is much easier to see from the outside than the inside. It's like... Um, you ever have that person who they complain about their financial situation, right? I never have enough. I'm really having trouble making ends meet. They kind of talk about it all the time. And then you pull up to their house and you see a brand new $45,000 car sitting in their driveway. And you think to yourself, what? You're obviously not learning from your mistakes. Or, you know, that first event as a minor for possession of alcohol and you get a few weekend classes, that would be inconvenient enough. It's supposed to deter you into something different. But the second events leads to community service, then a DUI, then a restricted license, higher insurance. And what's happening is all that pain is being completely wasted. The tragedy is not that we make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But that we are prone to make the same mistakes. The heartache is not that we experience pain, but that so much of our pain goes wasted when we refuse to learn from it. Interesting. God wants us to learn from our mistakes. His discipline is actually a gift. But there's another thing going on in this story. And, uh, and it helps to get the whole picture. This, this, is, this, this really changed the narrative for me when I, when I thought about this. The Israelites, when they have this whole issue with the quail, are not at the beginning of their journey. They're at the end. They've already been traveling for well over a year, close to you know, a year and a half they've been traveling already. And this incident with the quail happens not that long before the single saddest incident in the entire wanderings of the Israelites in the desert. Because they reach this place called Kadesh, um, right on the border of the Promised Land, and this is the goal. This is where they've been going for almost two years. They've been traveling. This was the place. This was the, this is where God was taking them. This is where they were supposed to end up. It's the fulfillment of everything God had promised. It's what he had told Abraham way back when. This is going to be your promised land. I mean, they are so close to their goal, they can taste it. And so Moses, if you know the story, he sends out 12 spies. He said, well, this makes sense. Let's send out 12 spies and we'll, we'll, we'll scout out the land. And so you remember he sends one from each tribe. And they go scout out the land for 40 days. So for over a month, everybody's just sitting and waiting. What are we going to hear? What are we going to hear? I wonder what it's going to be like. What are they going to tell us? And do you remember what happened? They came back. And there they reported it to, to them and to the whole assembly. In other words, they came back and it was just, people were just crowding around. I mean, they wanted to hear, right? They wanted to hear, like, we've been waiting for 40 days. Tell us what this is about. And so they gave Moses this account. You can tell them, you can just picture this, right? They're telling Moses, you got the 12 spies, and people, I mean, they're just gathered. They're saying, what, are you, what is he saying? What is he? They're listening. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. In other words, they brought stuff back that said, yeah, this is a good place. I mean, this is the kind of place we want to live. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, the uh, giants, people that have all this. 
next. There we go. They continue. They say the Amalekites. I mean, they live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites. They live in the hill country. The Canaanites live near the sea. Basically, they're saying, look, it doesn't matter where you go in this amazing land. There are enemies everywhere along the Jordan. And then Caleb silenced the people before Moses because you can, you can just hear, right? The crowd's starting to murmur like, what, what are we getting ourselves into? They're kind of hearing the report. There's some, and Caleb just says, whoa, stop, stop. Everybody, just stop talking for a second. He said, before Moses, he says, we should go up. We should take possession of land for we can do this. We can certainly do this. But the men who had gone up with him, said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. By the way, this was not an incorrect statement. It was an absolutely correct statement. They were stronger than the Israelites. They had armies. They had cities. They were fortified. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. So you can see the guys, you know, they're kind of, you know, Caleb's up here trying to make the argument, and they're turning to their, their, their clan leaders. They're like, no, there's no way. Like, if we do this, we're all dead. They begin to spread this bad report. They said, the land we explored, look at how they get very... It's worse, right? They start to raise the, their language. It devours those living in it. The people we saw there are of great size, right? You can just see. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anna come from Nephilim, which is kind of like an angelic being. Like we saw them. I mean, we seem like grasshoppers in their eyes. We look like the same to them. And as we read on, the people complain. They start to grumble. They turn on Moses, they turn on Aaron, they say, you guys, two years we trusted you, I can't believe you let us here. And despite Moses and Caleb and Joshua's pleas, the people rebel. And the result is catastrophic. Because God judges the entire nation. And he says, none of you who are adults get to taste the promised land. None. Your kids will, but you won't. In fact, you're going to wander the desert for 40 years until you are all dead. Then your kids are going to get to experience what was yours to have. See, God desires us to learn from our mistakes, and their response to God's discipline in the desert should sober us, but it should also give us a little bit of hope because God is always out to use pain redemptively. When you're in the desert and life is painful and you're depressed and things are struggling, you have to understand that God is never into pain for pain's sake. Right? We had a saying in our, in our family, um, when something bad would happen and someone would get hurt, I would look at my kids, I, I think I still, uh, they still make fun of me for this, because I would say, that's eh, okay, it builds character, right? Which, that might be true, it was a little flippant, but there's almost a sense in that, of, well, hey, stuff happens. And you have to understand, God is never out to inflict pain just because he wants to inflict pain whenever God disciplines. When he uses painful seasons in our life, it is always with a, review, a view to redemption. And you guys all understand this. Anyone who works out by going running outside when it is six degrees out understands the idea of redemptive pain, okay? And if you've ever gone and worked out of the gym and pushed yourself hard, you know what that looks like. It's a pain that you endure for a better future. Pain is, and, and here's what happens. Pain is something that we willingly embrace when we believe that it will serve a helpful purpose. I actually have never met someone who, if they really understood the purpose of the pain, they might not like it. They might like, ah, but yeah, I get it. I know it's important. I, I'm going to do it, right? I'm going I'm to stop eating burgers. This is just so painful for me, but I know I need to lose weight, right? I mean, they, they kind of, they get it. So I wonder if sometimes God is willing to inflict great pain to prevent astronomical The story with the quail, it's like God saying, you're not getting this. I have spent a year, almost two years, trying to get you to trust me, to know that I'm with you, that I am walking beside you, that I've got hold of you, and you're still not listening, you're still not complaining, so I'm going to send a plague, and it's going to kill some of you, but please, I'm trying to get your attention because I want you to have everything that I had ready for you. And if you don't change, 
I know what's going to happen. They didn't listen. In fact, it's interesting. If you go through the story of the Israelites through these entire wanderings, you'll notice that God keeps amping up the punishments and the pain and the issues that happen. They keep getting more and more severe. So when you see at one point when they rebelled, you know, the, the ground actually cracks open and swallows an entire family. I mean, it was crazy. But God is, he keeps upping the ante because he's like, we need to do this because if you don't get this, when we get to the promised land, the thing that I have been preparing for you since Abraham, you're going to miss it. The problem was they didn't listen. It's interesting because you read the prophet Hosea hundreds and hundreds of years later wrote this. He said, I have been the Lord, he's, he's speaking for God. I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of the burning heat. When I fed them, they were satisfied. And when they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. By the way, you've, you've, you've all experienced exactly what we're talking about here. You ever, you ever sat in a... Uh, or stood in the line at a grocery store and watched a child have a meltdown with their parent, right? You've all seen this. I can see you nodding. Yeah. And then what often happens? The child's having a meltdown. They want a candy bar. They want something. And the parent realizes everybody's watching them. Everybody's kind of getting a little antsy. They want the line to move in. So what do they do? They give in. Fine. I'm mad at you, but I'll get you what you want. What have they just done? reinforced the negative behavior that's now going to come up again and again and again. And we look at it from the outside and we think, oh, come on, you got to understand this, guys. I mean, you got, you, you got to deal with them. you got to draw the line. Because if we fail to correct certain weaknesses in their character, then the stakes, they only get higher with time. And left to themselves, centered, self-centered children end up being narcissist, narcissistic employees, husbands, and wives. That's the way they are. See, the goal of discipline is to correct behavior when the stakes are low so that we won't have to do it when the stakes are high. Because here's the thing, guys. God loves you too much to let you go on your own way. And it is way too often that God's trying to get our attention. We're like, yeah, but I'm kind of living my life the way I want to live it. I'm kind of busy. I'm doing my thing. God's like, hold on a second. I'm trying to get your attention here. And he'll let a couple things come into our lives to try and get, we're like, oh, I'm just going to soldier through, I'm going to power through. And God's like, no, listen, you're missing this. And you've seen this and you've seen people over and over for years ignore God and then they're in their mid-30s and their life collapses because God keeps turning up the temperature, not because he's interested in pain, but he's like, no, you're missing out what I have for you. So the whole question here is when we're in the desert, Pay attention, right? When you're in the desert, pay attention. What's going on? I mean, do you find yourself blaming other people for everything that's happening to you? Are you blaming God? Is it just the fault of those? I mean, they didn't understand me. They treated me poorly. You know, if it wasn't for them, I'd be doing this. Are you just doing the same things you've all done? Are, those, are there patterns of communicating or responding that are the same as they've always been in your life and nothing's different? Are there habits that you need to change? Are there blind spots that need to be exposed? When we're in the desert, we need to be asking these questions because only God knows what your future holds. He knew when he killed them with the quail what was coming just right around the corner. He knew it. He's like, I'm preparing you for it. You don't even see it yet, but I'm getting you ready if you'll just cooperate with me. He wants us to grow into the kind of people that he intends us to be, people who are not controlled by character deficits, but live more like Jesus. God's discipline, it's a gift. He intends that pain to do something in your life, so let's not waste it. So there's one more thing, I think, that we have to remember, and it's simply this. The discipline's actually a mark, then, of God's goodness. Now, I have to pause here, and I was looking over my notes this morning. I realized there was something in here that I hadn't approached, so I'm kind of it's just something the Spirit was talking to me about this morning. When you're in the desert, it's not always God's discipline. Sometimes the desert is just the desert. It's 
because we live in a broken world that's fallen and things have happened to us and things have happened around us and we struggle. So the issue is not that every time something's happening that God is disciplining you because I've had more people than I can count. I mean, literally, because I've said this, I wish I could just learn the lesson God is trying to teach me so I can get through the desert. You ever said that? Right? I just want to learn the lesson. God, what are you trying to teach me? I mean, if you just, I just want to get through this. So, I mean, teach me what it is and then we can move on. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes God's like, no, I'm just walking with you. Now, I think there's always lessons we can learn when we're in the desert, but it's not always his discipline. But that's why we have to be asking the questions. God, what is, it, what is going on? Are there things I'm missing? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? Is there something here that I am not seeing that you're desperately trying to get me to see? All because discipline is a mark of God's goodness. Um, and while it has limitations, actually how we deal with our children right, is a great uh, picture of what God is trying to do things. When I, when I punished and withheld things from my children... It purpose wasn't because I wanted to be mean to my kids. That was never the issue. But, and they might have even taken it that way. Hey, Mom and Daddy, you're so mean to me. Right? They may have taken it that way. That wasn't the purpose. It was, never was. I still remember the time one of our, our, our children had their first temper tantrum. Now, they were young, really young. And uh, in some ways, it was kind of cute. Right? You know, the old fall to the floor and pound your things. But I thought, if I look into the future... And what happens with this kind of behavior left unchecked? What kind of child am I raising? And so even though it actually took more effort, I dealt with it right then, right now, in a way that was probably more severe than you would have thought should be, and it was the last temper tantrum he ever threw. I was trying to develop him for something more. There's a great verse uh, in Scripture that says this. Whoop. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. The kids think they will, but they're not. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Now, it's funny because this seems harsh in our context today. We're like, oh, that's horrible. You can never do that to a child. But you have to understand, in the culture that this was written in, this was not hyperbole. Right? This wasn't an exaggeration to make a point. In a society that needed families to survive, a couple of days could mean the difference between a crop being harvested and a crop being lost. The loss of a crop could mean running into debt, which could mean selling your children into slavery to pay the debt, and the entire well-being of generations of people was tied to the family living together and everybody doing their part. So when it says, you use the rod, yes, you do. And use it to get them out of bed in the morning. Because it was better to do that than to overlook the problem. In fact, uh, all through Scripture, and you'll see this, if a parent refuses to discipline their child, it was actually noted as a passive form of hatred. Whoever spares the rod hates their children. If you watch a parent who spoils their children, who doesn't do anything to discipline them or guide them, what they're basically saying is, I don't love my children very much. And our culture doesn't say that. They're like, oh, no, they love their children. That's why they're not doing it. No, you're not. The one who loves their children is careful, careful, to discipline them. Sometimes when we're in the desert, it's pretty obvious what God is teaching us. Sometimes it's not so much. Sometimes it takes a little more energy. You have to do some digging and some listening and talking to other people who have a different perspective, who can say, no, nah, you're missing this. You need to learn this. I'll give you an example. I had lots of people over the years, and if you've been in church for any length of time, you know that lots of people leave churches. And they always leave with reasons. No one ever leaves a church and says, this is the best church I've ever been in. I love this church. I'm leaving. Right? Unless they move. Unless they moved. But this doesn't happen. When people leave, they're usually angry at somebody. They're angry at the pastor. Someone hurt them. Someone did something. They didn't agree with something. And they move. And they leave. And, what I, and unfortunately, I rarely be able to have the conversations because usually by the time someone's decided that, they don't want to have a conversation. It's like, do you realize that you're taking with you all your problems because you actually haven't listened to what God is trying to do in your life? And you're just taking it with you, and all that's going to happen is it's going to feel great, and you're going to move somewhere, and you're going to say, oh, these new churches, it's amazing. Look at all these people love me. Oh, you know what? This pastor gets it. Yeah, you know, these people really get me. For how long? Two, three years? And then you're like, oh, 
These people are just like the other ones. They still don't know how to treat me. I can't believe it. And I have watched people go from church to church to church. All the time God's saying, you're not, no, come on, you're not getting this. I want you to grow. I want you to move into something more. And they're not listening. Discipline is the activity of inflicting pain for redemptive purposes. It is something to, for which God is to be admired, appreciated, and esteemed. And no child who's been disciplined has ever said to their dad, oh, I really admire you, right? I mean, I just hold you in the greatest esteem for what you just did. I mean, you took away my phone for two weeks. Man, I'm so thankful. So we're not different, right? We come growing up, we, we deal with God the same way, and yet that's really what Jesus is calling us into. Shouldn't there be space in our thinking that there's a God who will discipline us as he sees fit for our God's discipline is a gift. The writer of Hebrews, though, he said this. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Do you see the purpose of discipline here? It's to produce righteousness. And when we pay attention to and embrace it, it'll always take us towards righteousness and peace. My friends, God wants us to learn from our mistakes. God actually has no problem with mistakes. He knows that happens. We know we're going to sin. We're going to make bad choices. We're not going to do the things we should do. He gets that. What he's inviting us into is saying, look, when that happens, let's learn from it. I mean, come on, talk to me. Lament with me. Let's have a conversation. I want you to learn from your experiences. Because he's loving and he's gracious and he wants the best for you. So the question that you have to go home with today is, do you spend your time when you're in the desert blaming others, including God, for the problems in your life? Or maybe you don't blame him, you just cut him out. You're like, meh, you don't really need to use God right now. Things are good. Are there certain patterns that you have of responding or communicating that never seem to change for you? Right, where you feel like you're going around that hamster wheel over and over again. I, I uh, heard about someone recently, and they'd had another problem in their church, and they said, I can't believe this is happening again. This is the third leader in a row that's treating our family poorly. Never ever thinking to themselves that maybe God's trying to do something in you. And the issue isn't them, it's that you're not listening to his discipline. Do you have habits that need to change? Are you willing to have the people in your life point out your blind spots? That one, my friends, is hard, but they see it. And if you really want to know, if you really want to be a follower of Jesus, is to say, someone you trust, say, am I off base here? Like, what is going on here? Here's how I want to conclude um, today. I was reading Psalm 106 this week. And in light of what we've been studying, it seemed to stand out. And I want to conclude with it. I'm going to read, a, it's a long psalm. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read a good chunk of it. And I'm not putting it up on the screen. I want you to listen. You can follow along if you want on your phone or in your app, or you can just close your eyes and listen. And this is written, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years after all these events that we just saw. Psalm 106. It goes like this. When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles, God. They didn't remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled at the, by the sea, at the Red Sea. And yet, he saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. And then they believed his promises and they sang his praise. But soon they forgot what he had done. They didn't wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. And so he gave them what he asked for, but he sent a wasting disease among them. In the camp, they grew envious of Moses and Aaron 
who was consecrated to the Lord. And the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and buried the company of Abiram. Fire blazed among their followers and a flame consumed the wicked. Do you see the pattern here? At Horeb, they made a calf, worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which eats grass. And they forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his wrath from destroying them? And by the way, this doesn't end. Because even after they wandered the desert for 40 years and went into the promised land, we read this. Then they despised the pleasant land. They actually didn't believe his promise that he was going to take them in. They grumbled in their tents. They did not obey the Lord. So he swore to them with an uplifted hand that he would make them fall in the wilderness because they didn't believe. You're going to die. And he made their descendants fall on the nations and scattered them throughout the lands. They yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. They sacrificed and offered to lifeless gods. They aroused the Lord's anger by their wicked deeds and a plague broke out against them. But Phineas stood up and intervened and the plague was checked. This was credited to him as righteousness for endless generations to come. By the waters of Meribah, they angered the Lord and trouble came to Moses because of them. For they rebelled against the Spirit of God and rash words came from Moses' lips. And it continues on. There's more about how their patterns of living continued when they went into the promised land and how they still didn't listen. They still weren't receiving the discipline of God. They didn't learn from their mistakes. And God's discipline was ignored over and over again. And it led to this story told many years later in Psalm 106. And the writer ends it by saying this. Save us, Lord our God, and gather us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. I wonder if someone else was writing the story of your desert, what would that story look like? Do you know that you get to decide what that story looks like? And when you're in the desert... You get to decide by saying, God, I'm going to lean into this. I don't get it. I don't like it. It's not what I want, but I am in. And then when someone tells your story later, they can say, look at that. And they became everything God wanted them to be.